Jericho with our brother Tariq Samarat, who is in Jericho from Ain al uh, He is part of the Black Palestinian uh, community in Ain al in Jericho, one of the oldest cities in the world, if not, I think it's the oldest city in the world. Um, and yeah, if people want to drop where they're from in the chat, um, I see we've got Alabama, um, Tuscaloosa, welcome. Um, we're really excited for this. We have had a fantastic few months um, despite everything that is going on, a fantastic few months of being able to elevate the voices of Palestinians in various areas in Palestine, as well as being able to support folks on the ground. So a lot of the organizations that we work with that you see during these educational programs, um, for example, on the 31st of January, we have a um, webinar with WICLAC, which is a women's center for legal aid and counseling, which specifically works with Palestinian women under occupation. Um, we will be donating 50% of what we raise to WICLAC. Um, and we try and do that with all the organizations that we work with and have um, live with us on these events. So we do always ask folks, you know, whatever you can give, whether it's a dollar, $10, $10,000, <laughs> please do so. We will drop the link into the um, the chat um, if you want to go ahead and make a donation. Um, we truly appreciate it. You can go to our website and make a donation, eyewitnesspalestine.org. And if you did miss any of our previous webinars um, from Bethlehem and Janine um, and various areas in Palestine, uh, please feel free on our website to go to past events and all the videos are uploaded there and you can watch them uh, later on uh, in the day. Thank you so much. We will shout out some of the places that we're getting here. We've got Vernon, BC, um, and we will shout you guys out in a little while. I'm going to pass the mic to our wonderful Maureen Kaki, uh, who is with Eyewitness Palestine to kick us off. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, Nancy, for the introduction, and thank you for everybody for being here today. Um, I know there's a lot happening, so it means a lot that you take a time to um, join another one of our webinars. My name is Murian. Um, I am the Programming and Operations Coordinator here at Eyewitness Palestine, um, and I'm very delighted to say that I had the chance to um, interview Thotic about a month ago, I think now Thotic, right? Um, uh, for our monthly newsletter, so you may recognize his name from that. And of course, we're excited to have him back um, with us. So Tariq, thank you so much for your time today. Would you mind um, just introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about yourself? Hello, good evening, everybody, or good morning for you, because like 7 p.m. here. So my name is Tariq Samarat. I'm from Jericho. I'm Palestinian. I was born and raised in Jericho. And... So, um, I don't know what this else. I'm waiting for the questions, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think what you were talking about earlier, too, Thotic, um, how old you are, what you used to do, and why. Um, would you mind sharing that again with us? Yeah, sure. Actually, I used to do sports, especially running as an athlete. I started as a beginner, but I found it such a great way to do something positive in my life and clean my mind. Because we start, all of us here start work really early. After school, we're 10 years old, 7 years old, and 12, and working hard. Uh, so I found the time to run uh, in a club in Jericho called Jericho Youth Club. I was a beginner, and I found running such an amazing way to clear your mind and make you feel positive among these really hard situations we live here. So... I continue with it and I was training hard and after three years, I found myself really good and I registered for a program. So, and somehow every two or three good runners are really, really good from each club. They have a chance to go to Italy. So it was a, a really hard uh, test, but I made it and I went with them to Italy to do professional uh, races there. So in 2016, I went to Italy especially to an island called Sardinia. And I did a couple of races there, also in Rome. And my team, who went from Jericho, 
he got the best positions and then we got some medals, some money and some rewards. And I liked it really there. So also I learned Italian. It was a golden chance for me. I was in touch with that com uh, with that organization. And they did some other jobs in Jericho after one or two years. And I was their translator actually from Italian to Arabic and vice versa. And also I got myself a job in translation from Italian to Arabic to English uh, during my job because in the last three, four years, I used to work as a host in a hostel in Jericho called Aubergine Guest House. And I'm, I'm a host and a translator, a tourist guide. And in my part-time job, uh, part job, I used to teach Italian as well. I finished my university. I studied English literature uh, just to have a degree, actually, because we are all busy working here. And if you study, you can't find a good job eventually. It's really hard to find a job here. Most of the jobs are in construction or other stuff. So I didn't work on my, my degree. I continue with tourism. Uh, then I found myself other stuff to do like as a receptionist and in the beach at the Dead Sea, or I used to work in welding and other area places because we make more money than other jobs. Actually working with the Palestinian Authority government, you can't get much money actually to make a living. So we have to do two, three jobs at once to make it. And it's really, really hard during this time, especially because there's really are closing Jericho and we can't go back to our old job outside of the cities. And we are trying to do anything, anything around, just to make a few money. Thank you so much, Sadek, for that introduction and for sharing some of that with us. Um, we're gonna touch up on some of the um, things that you talked about in our follow-up questions for you here in a few minutes. Um, I do wanna ask you about, the, my first question to you involves um, the sort of historical sites of Jericho and, and stuff. So uh, Thodic had recorded some videos for us earlier this week um, to share. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, show those to you all. And then I'll ask you Thodic to, to sort of explain those um, and, and the sites and and, and Rehab. Sure. You know, Morin Jericho is so historical. Uh, as everybody knows, it's one of the, it's the oldest city in the whole world, more than 10,000 years of culture. Um, many prophets passed nice. from okay. here. So many I'm gonna share it here and now. Um. Are you all seeing the video on the screen? Yeah, I see it. No. Okay, thank you. Just still photos. Okay, thank you. I think there is two photos and two videos, but we can talk about it in general. Yeah, let me see. I have them here. I just need to get to the right place. There we are. Okay, and here we go. Now we can see the video. Thank you. The main source of a Duke Spring comes from the corner of that area near the mountain. We have the system of water canals to give water for the farms or for the water tanks for the municipality, also for a water factory for natural mineral water called Jericho Mineral Water Factory. All of this area called a duke. So a little bit about that from Thodic and the water factory. Let me go ahead and pull up the other video. Yeah, so as I said before, the main, the primary source of the uh, living in Jericho is agriculture. And thank God we have lots of water in Jericho. We have two main springs. The first one called a Duke Spring. Uh, it's a spring in the mountain of the village of a Duke. And it gives all of the water, uh, the area and Jericho natural water. 
So they built a factory for natural mineral water there called Jericho Natural Mineral Factory. And also we have an old system to take all of the waters for the farmers, which is water canals. So each one have a couple hours or minutes of water from the spring. Then they just blocked one side from the water canal, which goes to the his neighbor or like to the other farmer. And some of this water like go to the municipality, then they send it by pipes for the houses and they pay monthly for that. Uh, others, they sell it for other farmers. They don't want to use it. And we have Ain Sultan Springs, which is near Tel as Sultan. Darit, who controls the water? So now it's directed by the municipality of the area of Al Duke and the municipality of Jericho. It's only one municipality actually. So the the municipality control the Palestinian government, the municipality municipality of Jericho control this water, and you have to pay for it month by month or other part, the old families there, they have it for free. And somehow they have a portion of it for free for their farms. And also, a part of this water go by pipes for the El Israeli. They took, uh, they put a pipe. So there is exactly a settlement out of Jericho near the spring. So they take water from there as well. Most of the other springs also controlled by Israeli. They have so many pipes everywhere to take water to the settlements around or their business around. But this my two main springs stays in Jericho and most of the water goes for the people in Jericho. I do have just one question, sorry to, to interject, but because you brought up the springs, I remember I sent um a, a couple of people that were out there um to visit you. And while you were there, something that I've seen happen before is um settlers um some soldiers in uniform they come and use the spring and harass people in jericho is that true that's true yeah yeah i was with a, a group of people i think you know them they're your friends so we went for a visit to the spring and we found some workers from the municipality working there so we went inside and then out of sudden there is some settlers came up those settlers, they're not even soldiers. They just have weapons because all of the settlers around, they have weapons. They came to the spring because they live nearby, out to Jericho in that settlement. And they just came to make problems, just to swim in the main source for drinking in the water. And nobody can do anything about them because they have weapons, we don't have anything. And we called the police for them, but they don't do anything, actually. The police, they can't do anything. They just call the uh, main office for the nearest settlements and tell them there is some settlers like making some troubles around, try to control them, you know, to avoid problems. Otherwise, uh, they just come from time to time to annoy people, to take to swim in the water, to even sometimes they steal some sheep from the uh, people around the area. They just do this uh, from time to time just to annoy the people as a kind of pressure on them. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Thadik. I'm gonna go back to the videos that you, uh, the other two videos that you offered um, for us. So here we go. From this point, we see a mount of temptation. And here we have the cable car station. And that one is the monastery of Mount of Temptation. This area called Ain Duke. And the main spring for Ain Duke located there exactly, between these mountains. And there's one more, if you'll bear with me for just a second. Oh, that one's short, I think.
I'm going to replay it, Tarek. I don't think it has audio, right? Uh, it's not. It's without audio. Uh, I think it's really short. Yeah, yeah. It looks like it was uh, just a close-up of the monastery, right? I think I have a really bad camera. I couldn't make a good shot for this. <laughs> no, it was pretty clear. It seems like it was far away. And there's one last photo um, that you sent. Is that something you'd like me to show now, too? I'll go ahead and share it here. Yeah. And where is this at, Thought I This is for the viewpoint to see the amount of temptation. There is a, you know, it's like they sell pomegranates for the tourists. Jericho is so touristic. So there is so many tourists, they come to this spot and they ride the camel. They buy some gifts, groceries, and they have some fresh juice there. So many buses and stops by there and they take a break and enjoy the view. Then they go after that to Mount of Temptation to visit the monastery from inside. Oh, wow. Okay. Now they called Mount of Temptation because uh, Jesus was tempted by the devil there and he stayed there for 40 nights fasting. So they called Mount of Temptation. I didn't know. Uh... Thank you. Um, the so which ones are, I know you showed us some of the 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 sites and where the water springs are, um, but can you tell us a little bit more about Ariha's history in general? Um, and yeah, um, some of your favorite. The, which ones are your favorite of the sites? So actually, one of my favorite sites is Hisham's Palace because there we have the biggest mosaic uh, on the floor, and. It was uh, since Amawi period, Fadr al Amawiya. So that palace destroyed by earthquake, and they rebuilt it again. Uh, they covered the mosaic with a big carpet and sand to keep to protect it. And then we got some funds from JICA, people in Japan also, to make a dome on the top of that uh, mosaic. So if you come to Jericho now, we can go to Hisham's Palace and see a huge mosaic on the ground with a great history. And the star of Hisham's Palace, the main star of the palace, it's in the middle of the palace. And after that, I think uh, St. George Monastery is one of my favorite places there. It's an ancient Greek Orthodox monastery located in the middle of what they call you can do hiking hikes there. So you can do a short hike or a full hike, which is 10 kilometers to 22 kilometers there. Also, there is a spring in the middle of the valley. That's beautiful. And and if you if you don't mind me asking, is it are these sites um are they controlled by like a um an archaeological society? Is it the municipality, the Palestinian? Um, who Who is it that maintains these sites? So it depends because even though we are in Jericho and it's controlled by the Palestinian Authority, in so many cities also in Jericho we have something called Area C, which is some piece of land controlled by the Israeli. Uh, for example, one of the sites like Hisham's Palace, it's located in a place called Area A which is under the Palestinian Authority. And we can do working with there, some preparing, make it nice, you know, take care of it. But other places like uh, Herod's Palace, it's located in Area C, as what the Israelis said. We can't build any houses there. We can't do any job there. We don't, can't do anything good for the area because simply they're going to come from the uh, camp uh, and they destroyed it. So the way to uh, St. George Monastery, also we can find Israeli on the way, or army, or settlers from the nearest uh, settlements. So St. George Mon uh, Herod's Palace, we can't do anything there. It just destroyed some old ruins. You just go there and you find some old ruins. Now that there is no official job there, professional job, there is nothing. You just pass by and continue your hike to St. George Monastery. And you can find so many people there, especially Israeli and settlers. Because, you know, they control some pieces of land around that area.
Tarek, somebody asked if you could repeat the name of the monastery. And they're asking, do you know how many uh, monks are there? And what do they do about Israeli presence? Yeah, sure. So the monastery called St. George. St. George Monastery, which is a Greek Orthodox monastery located in the middle of Wadi Kelt. At the moment, there is three or four monks living there now. Uh, because inside the monastery, there is also four graves of the one of the oldest monks who built the monastery. These monks, uh, they run away from the assault of the person since Herod's Palace period, you know. They run away to the monastery to save their religion and themselves. They stayed hiding in what they called. They lived in caves. And after that, they built the monastery as a spiritual spot for them. And uh, no, it's control. It's, it's safe for them there, actually, because, you know, it's protected. It's like an ancient area, historical area. So many people take care of it from both sides, from the Israeli side and from the Palestinian side. So and somehow they are safe there. Nobody comes to annoy them. And, you know, it's international because it's also Greek Orthodox. All of these monks, they are not from Palestine. They came from Greek to here and they take care of the monastery and they live inside there. Thank you, Tarek. Um, uh, do you mind sharing? I know for some folks might already know this, but Ariha, and I think Nancy might have said it in the introduction, but folks who joined, um, Jericho is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, like archaeologically speaking. And aside from aside from the actual like sites and stuff that you've talked about, Tarek, in terms of the the monastery, Hashem's palace, um, um is can you speak to Eddie has history a little bit more broadly too in that age? Yeah, I mean talking about the history of Jericho. Yes. Okay. Yeah, sure. So uh, I don't know which part you mean talking about history. You know, Jericho a long time ago it was uh, empty land with. Some people live in different places, you know. Each spot, you can find a group of people living there. So a long time ago, it, uh, people used to do pilgrimage. Uh, it's not so uh, so far away, like, you know, not so long from the past, because so many civilizations passed from here, like Kanani, for example. So people used to do pilgrimage all the way from abroad to Jerusalem, to other places. Uh, so many people just stayed in this empty land. And you can't just say, like, okay, this village in Jericho and these people are living here. They just came and stayed. So that's why you have uh, mixed people here. You have, like, uh, black people, white people, people from so many countries. Also, like, my neighbors are originally from Nigeria. Their grandfather is from Nigeria, but all of them are Palestinian here. So... Uh, you can you can know the history about Jericho from the sites exactly here, like the Dead Sea, like Hisham's Palace since the Amawi Islamic period, the construction of, of the old ancient houses here. Also, a part of it, it was controlled by Jordan because we are nearby the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River. I don't know what to say specifically about it, actually. I need some specific questions. I have some questions for you. Let me turn my camera on. Hi, Tarek. I've known Tarek for years, and um, I have brought quite a few delegations to you. Um, I, you know, I witnessed Palestine for 20 years, um, Interfaith Peace Builders, I witnessed Palestine, has been doing delegations to Palestine. I want to know what these, especially being from Aina Duke, which we'll get into um, the Palestinian Black experience in a minute, but... What have these delegations meant for you as a young man? Because I've known you since you were young. I mean, he's he's still young, yeah. And <laughs> but in no, you know, I've known you since you were young, young. And I'm just wondering what these delegations have meant for you. Like, have you kept relationships with the people that came? Do you feel that they make any difference to the Palestinian struggle? Um, you know, people witnessing firsthand. What does that mean for you as a Palestinian on the ground? And do you feel that it's productive? 
نانسي ايش على الديليجيشن كل مرة؟ يعني تور نفس الشيء زي تور او ديليجيشن هو نفس الكلمة انه ناس انه الناس اللي بنجيبهم لعنكم اه تجربتي معهم يعني؟ يا yeah, انه انه قديش مهم انه احنا عم نجيب ناس على البلاد، انه بنقدر نحكي لهم قديش بنحكي بس انه هن يجوا يشوفوا no. ايش مهم لإلكم يعني والله well, it's, it's so important actually because for for couple reasons one of the first of all I'm really glad for their visit they came and they see the truth by their eyes like so many people can talk about things happening here and here and here but you know eventually for people to believe they have to see by their eyes they, we can't just uh, believe what we hear especially from the social media uh, we have to see the full story the reality So all of the people that they came, I felt that they really can show the true image of what, what they saw here to their countries, to their people around. So I met so many people, especially my work in tourism. I met so many people from around the whole world. They just came for tourism. And I asked them, like, why you came here, you know? Some of the people told me, like, it's a cheap flight. Uh, but my, my, so many of them told me we came to see the reality. We heard so many news and we got sick of it. We came here just to see the, the reality that what people talk about. And they told me, like, everyone came. They said, like, okay, we're going to tell our friends, our people, the people around about the truth. Because and somehow also the Israeli, they control the social media. Uh, about other stuff, uh, yeah, I feel that our the truth will go straight to your countries around. Another problem, we can't also express our feeling or like what we do or like, for example, I can't share whatever I want. That's really are watching. If I, I post uh, something or like I said something, they're gonna come and arrest me. It's so easy, especially these days. I will tell you a short story, Nancy, that happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, my cousin, he's the cousin of my dad, he wrote on Facebook, He wrote on Facebook, 7th of October is a nice day. You know what they did? They saw that, they came, they took him to the jail, and they investigated with him, like, why you wrote that? Why 7th of October is a nice day for you? He couldn't uh, know what to say. He told them it's uh, just happy for someone because he got a new child. They didn't believe him. They know it's uh, something about 7th of October, and he support the resistance and like this, and they fired him from his job. because he used to work in an industrial area that's controlled by the Israeli. They took the permission from him. And so many others, also the same story. If you post something, they're going to come and arrest you. If they saw the flag of Palestine, or like you wrote something about them, or we showed the video or a story, they're going to come and arrest you. So we can't even talk about what we want to talk about. If I want to share, to, to, show, to show the whole world about what ha what's happening here, I will be sure that they're going to come and arrest me because it happened thousands of times around. And they don't care if you are girl or boy, young or old. They just take everyone. So for because so many people from your side, guys, and other people came and they saw the truth. So it's really good for because they, can, they, can, they can't talk freely. Nobody can come and arrest them for sharing some news, you know? Staying on that subject of what's happening right now, um, you know, with the genocide happening in Gaza, there has been, I know many people are not, um, are not really, I mean, some people are paying attention to what's happening in the West Bank, but I think people are not really realizing the extent of the violence um, that is happening to the Palestinians in the West Bank. And in Jericho, people also may not know that There are um, refugee camps in Jericho also um, that have been under heavy attack. Can you just tell us a little bit? Because there have been many people in Jericho that have been killed um, by the occupation um, army since the, uh, I mean, before the 7th of October, but also during this period in the last few months, there has been quite a few deaths as well. Can you just tell us a little bit about the political situation on the ground and um, how Jericho, you know, the entrances and exits and how that gets blocked off where people can't leave, um, restriction of movement, and also the attacks on Jericho itself. Sure. 
So as you saw before, Nancy, you came to Jericho several times. I know that Jericho has three entrances to go and to come in to go out. And around each one, there is nearby a place for the Israeli. So they just can block the way in one second and close it. They open it anytime they want. Recently, the situation became really, really bad. It's like really the worst because now it's not organized like before. Like before, they, if you they want someone, they come inside, they took him and they go outside. Easy. But now they close all of the city. And you know, Jericho is like, we need tourists, we need people to come, we need uh, the way to be open. But they closed it and people are getting starving and they can't, they have no jobs or nothing. So now they are like shooting randomly. They come to the camps. They are crazy about the camps in Jericho, Aqb Jabber camp, refugee camp, and Ain Sultan refugee camp. These two places are the most. They just come, especially the same time, between two after midnight and four in the morning. They come, they shoot anyone in the street, you know? If, if you have nothing to do, if they saw you on the street, they're gonna shoot you. Because they are, as what they say, in a sensitive situation, and they're really angry and mad about what's happening in Gaza. You know, it's like a victory for the Palestinians, and it's a big slap on their faces. So, they are, if something bad happened for them, they just come to Jericho to destroy some houses, they kidnap some people. If they think that you are suspect, they're gonna come to your house and they take you. Take you, your friends, your brothers, anybody who was with you on the street, anybody who threw a rock, anybody who tried to bump something. They gonna just take everyone. Uh, they used to do it uh, last month, almost every two days. Almost every two days, they come to Jericho, they take some people, or most of the times for nothing. They just come like this, you know, with a couple of jeeps, so many soldiers, they just shoot out the houses, they just do a tour destroy some things, taking some people sometimes, and they leave. Uh, which has become really bad because now, if they saw anyone in the street, they're gonna shoot him because they think he's gonna shoot us or do something bad. But they are ready to do anything they want because, uh, I don't know if you can say this in English, يعني, you know? What's they release it? the frustration, Yani. Yeah, exactly. Something like this. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that, Tariq. Um, it's I can't imagine a lot of a lot of attention has rightfully been turned to Gaza, but to know that this stuff is happening throughout the West Bank and beyond is 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 equally horrifying. Um we're going to transition in terms of the topic a little bit. Um, like Nancy had talked about and um, Dadek had referenced earlier, we know that Ayna Duk is predominantly a Black Palestinian community. And for people outside of Palestine, there's always the question of how different the Black ex Palestinian experience is from you know, being non-Black Palestinians. So I have two questions in that regard. Um, do Black Palestinians feel any differently to other Palestinians because of their color? And do do you feel like Israelis treat you differently because of it? Actually, yes. Uh, at the beginning, you can't uh, even distinguish the difference or like you can't even realize there is a difference because everybody here, like and somehow they love each other, respect each other. Uh, we're all sharing almost the same religion. Um, with the way we grew up, there is no difference between like if you are white or black, it's all equal, but you can find some racism in some specific spots. Uh, let's begin with the Israeli, for example. For some reason, uh, sometimes the Israeli, if they saw a black person, they make it easy on him, not like the white Palestinian. Uh, maybe from, there is no specific reasons, but they think that Bedouins are more peaceful and quiet than other people. They think all the white people comes from the refugee camp and they're making troubles. And they think that the black people, uh, because so many black people, they came from Bir Sheva or Bir Sabi, as what they call it, from Bir Sabi. So they think and somehow that we all sharing the same attitude or like we are quiet and peaceful and we didn't make troubles. Uh, from other aspects, uh, let's say about 
the Palestinian among themselves, uh, it's not a lot. It's rare to happen. Uh, sometimes they think, okay, like if you are black, you are making troubles or you are on drugs or you smoke weed or something like this, you might be like not that good or like always angry, you know? They keep thinking about this uh, way. Or sometimes if you want, uh, you are black, you want to go to marry a white woman, you might find that his her parents said that, like, no, we don't want to be in a connection, blood connection with black family, you know? And this way and somehow. Uh, but they don't respect the, cho the choice of their daughter, for example. Like if the girl, she wants a boy, they don't care about that. Like, no, we don't want because if you get married, you will marry the whole family. You will be in touch with the whole family. So sometimes they cut, they try to make this separated. But at the same time, they respect you, they treat you well, and there is no problem. But still, this part of racism exists. exists. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember you talking about that a little bit in our interview, too, um, in terms of the way that that kind of anti-Blackness pops up. Um, would you would you mind, Thodic, define, like sort of talking about what racism means to Black Palestinians? Because we, we have a particular, we've come to define that word in a particular way in the U.S., right? And and there's anti-Blackness, right, that, that exists everywhere, but it the, the the definition of racism may not necessarily be this sort of same thing. So would you mind just talking about how you define racism as a Black Palestinian? So, uh, you know, like about racism, uh, I think there is only one definition for it in general, but I'm um, talking about racism, about treatments here, uh, not about if you are because you are really Black or white, but the difference about the treatment which I found it also not because if you are only black, but it's between if you are black or Bedouin, or if you are uh, white from the north, or if you are uh, from Jericho, or if you are this kind of racism is the same actually. Uh, it's all the same, not different. For example, uh, you can be white from Jericho and you want to get married from Hebron, but they don't want to accept that because you're not from Hebron. So now it's about the city, not about your color. Uh, if you go to the police, no, that's the same with the police, actually. If you are black, if you are maybe selling drugs. It's like for sure and somehow. So there is not much different for definition, actually, for the racism. It's just about the treatment sometimes. Can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Um, do you mind sharing? Um, do you mind sharing a little bit more about your own personal experience, whatever you'd be comfortable with, um, whether that's with Israelis or Palestinians? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I had some personal experience with the Israeli. Uh, it's the, the racism in this issue it's about being Arabs from the West Bank or Arab from the Israeli side which they control it or Arabs from Jordan for example they are really friendly if you are Arab from Jordan because you are out of Palestine uh, I, was, I used to work in Tel Aviv with some friends of mine who are all black but I have a permission to work there, but I'm from the West Bank. My friends, they have Israeli IDs because they are from Beersheba. So we are all Arabs. We found the police and uh, they took me for an investigation because like, what are you doing here? And You know, their way of talking were, was kind of angry and bad because they call me Arab or like from, I don't know, from the West Bank. So I'm so much different from the same Arabic guy who have Israeli ID and he lives inside. They felt like, like the, the way of treatment, it was like they are, my friend is from their side or like, uh, I don't know if they consider him Arabic Israeli. Uh, but for me, because I used to have a green ID from the Palestinian Authority, they, um, I'm kind of making a troubles for them or 
I might make uh, an attack or like shoot someone or do something wrong. So if you are Arab from the West Bank and they catch you in Israel, even if you are legal and they have a permission, they're gonna make some troubles for you. Uh, and somehow I I have also I know some Israeli people and uh, like I got into a long term conversation for them with them. And as I understand, the the Israeli think or like they believe that all of the Arabs, not only from Palestine or Jordan, but all of the Arabs eventually they're gonna be slaves for them in when some time come. And this is a really true story. Like they they told me this is in their religion. It exists there. One day, uh, there Jesus will come, and all of the Arabs will be slaves for the Israeli to serve them. So that's why they treat Arabs in a really shitty way. You know, they really hate them from the depth in their hearts because they think, okay, you are going to be my slave one day. I have to deal with you now. And this thing is still, some people hide it. Some people are so clear with them. They don't feel shy to treat you this way everywhere. It happens in front of my eyes uh, when I used to work in the beach as Nancy saw once. I have a friend, uh, I think Nancy know him, Ahmed Shkir. So one Israeli woman uh, asked him to get inside because he worked on the ticket store. He told her, you can go inside. And she said, uh, from the beginning, why you make it so long, you dog? She called him a dog. Then he he called her back and he told this another Israeli woman she works with him. Uh, at the same time, the Israeli woman, she went again and she brought that lady and she made her apologize for him and ask him to get inside. So, yeah, she came back. She apologized for him, for her attitude. And she said, if you can allow me to go inside. And he said, OK, you can go inside. Then the Israeli woman said to her friend, like you see, he's a really good guy. He is better than you. Why you treat him this way? But from my side, it's about business. Business is business. Like when we work with Israeli, the, the, the attitude is really good. The way of talking is really good. They respect us. If it's, there is business uh, between us, everything is so good. You can't feel any, you can't feel any racism or like uh, hard feelings. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Tarek. Um... I want to go back and ask you some more about your personal experiences related to, and you kind of touched up on this in the introduction when you were talking earlier, but um, about your experience as a professional athlete and and going to Italy. Um, what was, I mean, what, how did the occupation affect your experience of traveling, of becoming an athlete? Um, you talked about the way the occupation sort of put you on that track because there's not a lot of job security, there's not a lot of opportunity as a result of the occupation. So you ended up joining the Jericho Youth um, uh, Sports Club and and did became a professional athlete. Um, but were there barriers specifically that you and your teammates had to go through uh, because of the occupation in order to do that? Yeah, and somehow at the beginning, it was really hard for us to travel around, you know. Most of the time, we used to go to only to Jordan uh, to compete, to make some competition there, to do some training, sport camps, uh, running, and like this. Uh, we have a marathon in Palestine. We make it, we call it Palestine Marathon. We make it in uh, Bethlehem because the streets are quite big there, and it's enough to make a marathon there. We run exactly beside, uh, next to the the wall, the separation wall between Palestine and some other Israeli parts. Uh, we keep running there with the flags of Palestine. It's really hard sometimes to go from one city to another city because of the checkpoints. Why you are a group, always in investigation, why you are traveling together, what you want to do, why you are running, why you have the flag of Palestine. And somehow, also when we travel, we can, we keep going also to as what they call it window number ten or like window number six for investigation. If there is something wrong, you can you have to go there, keep waiting for hours, asking you weird questions, why you are traveling, what you wanna do, where you are going. For other people, it's really easy to travel if you have if you have foreigner passport like Jordanian passport or like European passport, etc. 
But if you have Palestinian passport, they're gonna keep asking you so much question. That's what I saw exactly when I went to Italy. Uh, I saw everyone, everyone is passing by, but us, every time we have to stop by a specific place, to keep, uh, they ask, keep us asking questions. The reason why we're traveling, why we're going exactly, what you wanna do. At the same time, once we come back, they look at all of our stuff, uh, what you did, where have you been, uh, did you talk to some people about something, and they check our phones, our gifts, and somehow. Uh, we, they make us feel like we make, uh, we are making something wrong. We are also all the time about to make a trouble or to do a, a disaster. So and somehow this make you feel uh, depressed because sometimes you will be like, okay, I'm sick of it. I can't handle this anymore. Why I keep passing from going through these issues? Uh, but eventually, you know, uh, the results are really good. So it, it's encouraged us to keep going in this field. So, uh, for example, my coach, he went to so many countries. Also, like the same thing happening, not only for running or sports or also for studying. If you are Palestinian, you will stop by the Israeli side every time because you are traveling to another country and you are coming back and... They're gonna make sure that you didn't go to bring something. You like to talk to some people uh, that you wanna make uh, problems for them and somehow. So in general, if you are Palestinian, you will have some hard time while traveling. You will stop a lot. You will get a big uh, have so many questions to be answered about. Thank you, Tarek. Um, so. I want to give a chance for folks to ask questions. Um, first of all, I just want to shout out some of the people that are in the room so you know where the questions are coming from um, and where everybody's from. So uh, we have people that drop their location in the chat. So we have people from Alabama, from New York City, from Providence, Rhode Island. We've got one of our board members, Paula, from Chicago, um, San Antonio, Texas, um, which I know Maureen is repping as well, <laughs> Chapel Hill. Uh, North Carolina, we've got folks from Mexico, um, Ottawa, Canada, uh, Cold Spring, New York, Silver Spring, Maryland. We've got someone from Nebraska. Um, we've got a brother Raj from India. We've got folks from Boston, Washington, uh, Sonoma, California, Olympia, Washington, um, Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, Massachusetts, uh, Vernon, we've got Tacoma, Washington, Hudson Valley, Puerto Rico, from Palestine to Puerto Rico, free the land, North Yorkshire, the United Kingdom, Santa Fe, Denver, Colorado, we've got St. Paul, Minneapolis, um, that's really beautiful to see, West Yorkshire, I see, Merced, California as well. Um, so real quick, I want to address one question because I am what they call an Israeli Arab. Um, and somebody asked, how do Palestinians get Israeli IDs? So uh, my father was born in 1939 when Haifa was Palestine. Um, you know, my grandparents had Palestinian passports. Um, and so we are Palestinians with Israeli IDs. Um, and that's what we call Palestinians or what they call Arab Israelis. We call ourselves Palestinians living in what they call Israel proper. Um, and that's how we end up with IDs because, for example, my mother's family is from a village near Nazareth um, who were armed when the Jewish militias came in and were massacring villages, um, you know, around 48, the time of 48, 1948, uh, and they fought back and they didn't end up leaving the land um and when they handed over the weapons it was an exchange for them to be able to keep their villages so there are a few palestinian villages that are still um standing within uh, the 48 borders um which is israel proper um i'm going to go to the first question i mean there was a question of people asking um whether you were worried about speaking like on this uh zoom do you worry like someone said how safe is it for you to be able to do these calls how safe is it for you to take people around when they come and tour palestine um are you in danger of speaking with us today 
Um, and that's the first question. So it's such a really good question. And the answer is, uh, yes, it's dangerous for me to talk about this issue, also to post anything on social media. So I'm really sometimes uh, careful about what I post or where, not everywhere, especially not Facebook, because Facebook is the easiest place they can take you from. If you post something, they're going to catch you so fast. Either they call you to come to visit them or they come to pick you up from your house, which is so easy for them. Uh, that's why I keep posting on Instagram or other places. And about if um, um, it's dangerous for me to talk on this Zoom, I think it is, yes. But uh, actually, I don't care, you know, what they can do next. Uh, we saw what the crazy things that they did in Gaza and, and somehow... Uh, I don't know how to say that, but our hearts stopped working. I don't know, like, you know, we are became careless and somehow, like, uh, we, we, we have to do, we must do whatever, at least anything we can do just to support them in any possible way because we we don't have anything to fight with. Uh, we don't have any army and it's not safe. And, you know, uh, one person or like a thousand people walking around together with rocks, it's only one rock they're gonna throw at us or like shooting they're gonna kill all, all of us so and somehow we consider that our lives are really cheap for what the people in Gaza did and we have to do anything that we can do to help them at least so I am careless if the but it's still gender dangerous actually uh, what else about the second question about uh, taking people for tours around um yeah, I had some trouble sometimes because uh, they see tourists with a Palestinian guy and uh, sometimes they tell them like, uh, are you safe? You know, you are with this Arab, with this Palestinian, what he's t talking, what he's saying to you, don't believe him, you know. So this happened a couple of times in some places because some touristic places are located near the Israeli checkpoints or areas like between the highways. They have to pass from there. Yeah. Uh, most of the time, no, it's easy i we can pass through so easy and because with this pc tourist with me in the car and we think okay they're only tourists nothing dangerous they can pass by it's so easy uh sometimes they think i am tourist actually because they think at do they look at my color or like my hair or like i don't know they think sometimes i am uh african or something like this or ethiopian and they think i'm also tourist or american uh I, that's happened with me a couple of times. Mm, they don't think that I'm Arab. I don't know why, but sometimes it's good because it uh, saved me from some question or stabbing or investigation. Uh, another question. Yeah. Another one. What's the last thing? I forgot if there is more questions you can ask me. There's many more. Um, so one was about the refugee camps. Can you just name the two refugee camps in uh, Ariha? And are they camps from 1967 or the 50s? I know a lot of the camps were in 1950, 51. Um, and do you know where a lot of those residents are originally from? You know, like, are they from Jerusalem area? Are they from, do you know what areas they're from in 48? Uh, so uh, the first uh, refugee camp, which is the one, the oldest one, it's since actually uh, 1948, uh, called Aqab al-Jabr, Aqab al-Jabr refugee camp. Uh, the second one called Ain al-Sultan, because, you know, uh, the same name of uh, Tal al-Sultan, uh, about the numbers, I have no idea at the moment because so many people came and they left and so many people are living there now uh, just because they want to live in Jericho and there is no houses in other areas, but there is houses in the refugee camps, so they live there. And most of the people there, for example, Aqba uh, Jabber, I think there is no people from Jerusalem there. Uh, the majority are from the 48 lands. You can find so many people from Akka, Haifa, Yafa, and all of these uh, cities, the Palestinian cities that are occupied now. And 
I did a tour there and I met some old people there and you know they some of them they still have the key of their houses at the moment until now. Uh, they told me this key is the, our house in Akka from my grandma and like oh, and like this. Uh, Ayn Sultan is the same actually, not much different, but it's uh, since the 60s. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, another question from Maria. Can you talk about the semi-nomadic, like the Bedouin communities around Jericho, like the Jordan Valley, the ones that are in Area C, the under threat um, by Israel? Do they come to Jericho to look for work or to access services, or do they stay in their areas? Actually, now, in the past, exactly what I can tell you, in the past three years, the Bedouins around, they kind of trying to change their lifestyle. For example, they used to live near the springs, near the mountain. Uh, they have lots of sheep, they have lots of goats. But because of the annoying Israeli settlers, uh, the Israeli settlers, they come to the Bedouin. They kill their sheep, they shoot the sheep, they shoot the goats. You can find like hundreds of goats are dead on the ground. And the crazy thing are they are protected by the Israeli army. It's like uh, they let the settlers do, <coughs> they destroy things, they annoy the people, they, uh, they destroy the tents of the Bedouins. And the Israeli army are, are watching them, uh, protecting them. If they found any residents, they're going to support them against us. So, so many Bedouins, they came to Jericho or other cities because there is Bedouins around in each city. They live in the side of the village, in the side of the city, and when they have, uh, you know, nature for their goats. Uh, they sell the goats, they buy a small house, they build tents in the house garden, and they still have goats, but not like before. So they have both lifestyles. They live in the city, with a former house, and they have some jobs in construction and uh, other stuff. Also, some Bedouins are really smart. So, so many, so many of them, they got educated. So, we can find doctors, teachers, uh, managers, working his business, lawyers. You can find Bedouins doing the same thing, but the same thing you can find the school manager or like a lawyer, he come back home, he have his goats and he do the same things with his goats around, you know, like a shipper. So uh, some people say in 50 years, we might not have Bedouins because of what's happening around. Everywhere, the Bedouin, for example, uh, Nancy, you know, Tariq Al-Ma'arrajat, Al-Ma'arrajat Road, which takes you to Ramallah. Near the top, there was so many Bedouins, if you saw them before, and I think you did. Now there is nothing. All of the Bedouins came back, uh, they ran away, away from there because of the settlers nearby. They did a huge hit for them and they destroyed all the tents. They they couldn't uh, help in it. So their life were in danger. So they left the whole area, the whole area. Al Marrajat, I just want to tell folks, is one of the scariest, most beautiful <laughs> ways to get to Ramallah from the back of Jericho. It goes up these amazing mountains i had a panic attack coming down one uh last year <laughs> coming down the marajat of albi because there's no lights at all and you're like literally like cliffside but um i do want to say when we talk about the bedouins um this beautiful uh memory always comes to mind a very good friend of mine worked with bedouin children um near jericho ashira and she said to them uh, th there's a little clip that she showed me of one of the boys, the young boys. She said to him, you know, what if they offered you like a house in like a city somewhere? Would you take it? And he said to her, no. And she said, why? Uh, you'd have, you know, you'd have your own room and blah, blah, blah. And he said, because then how would I see the stars at night? And um, I don't know why that always stuck with me because um, they sleep outside. I mean, you know, it's it's pretty much containers and tents, but it's, I mean, the stars, the sky is beautiful there. So that always stuck with me that, you know, the beauty of nature is way more powerful than a concrete building. They can shove you in. Um, Alexandra asked a really beautiful question. What are some of the nice things that you do for yourself, Tarek? Um, let's see, it's a good question, actually. Uh, but actually, I, I do nothing. Uh, I stopped running. 
uh, because since I came back from Italy, I stayed with this uh, another one year. Then uh, I need the job uh, to take care of my family as well as myself and to build my own house because I can't live in a rental house because the income of the jobs here is really bad. I can't offer making a living and paying for the rent. So I'm building my own house since five years. I'm not finished yet. I have maybe to work another two years to finish it. And my job, my life became only working and sleeping, working and sleeping. And uh, even though I, I stopped reading, I don't know, I lost so many things that I like to do. It's just only, yeah, working, uh, taking care of my family and uh, trying to uh, travel one day maybe. But uh, since a year ago, I don't feel like I want to do anything, only just staying here, working. And I don't know, I found my happiness in working. I just like to work. Tarek, uh, Mimi said, thank you for your courage, Tarek. I can't speak Italian, but she said, grazie mille. No, no, no. Grazie mille. No. Grazie mille anche a tu. <laughs> and... Um, Stephanie said we should all be so brave thank you Anna thank you so much for being with us um, Sin said you're a hero Tarek thank you so much for educating us and using your voice to speak uh, Peter said we are the world and we are witnessing everything the lights are on what is done there is done here um, let me just go through uh, what organizations are allowed to help in Jericho um, in general and refugee camps. I remember when I came to Duke, there was like a UN little office, right, or something. What organizations are actually functioning or are there any independent or Palestinian orgs that um, are from Jericho that are helping uh, the people in Jericho? So mostly, as you saw before, it's the UNICEF or the UN, United Nations, uh... It's the, I think it's one of the strongest ones because it's uh, it gives like uh, it builds schools and uh, health centers and uh, gives some uh, goods for the people and there is the also the, there is they have a, a center or like an office to give uh, loans for the people if they need it you know they give you a loan and you have you can pay back every month there is also uh, JICA, you know, JICA is the Japan International Cooperation Agency or something like this. Uh, some others, they have a connection with the municipalities or with some private sectors. If they want to rebuild a street or uh, something like this, they get funded by this organization. I don't know what kind of the business they have, but they just send support and funds and they do this kind of jobs to improve the cities, the streets, the uh, agriculture. But yeah, as I know, I think remember, remember JICA and the United Nations. This Thanks. is for in general, but for others, uh, you know, uh, some people, it's like the young people, the youth, they do their own uh, kind of job, work. For example, they build a center for people to give them some courses, how to start their uh, life and working, or like how to, do they give just courses, to skills to make some administration or like management or to how to become a leader or some of that stuff. And uh, they have, they get found by some organization from the same country, from Palestinian people who have money they make this uh, small organization to support other people, other youth people in other cities. It's like NGOs. Oh, but no, it's uh, they have money. They give money for this. It's funded. Uh, I have <clears throat> a question. Well, first of all, shout out to Indonesia watching right now, Hawaii watching right now, Berkeley, California, and more San Antonio. <laughs> They're heavy in the building today. Um, somebody asked, uh, I'm going to give you both questions. Uh, somebody asked, is there a university in Jericho fi jama'a fi ariha? And the Bedouins that left al marrajat wa dhakkar ana kanu fuq hinni, uh, the Bedouins that left there, where do they go when they leave? 
So uh, first question, yes, we have a university in Jericho. Oh, it's called Al Quds Open it's University. And um, we have hello, can you hear me? Yes, so we it's hear. called Al -Quds, yeah, Al Quds Open University, and we have a branch in each in the whole West Bank. There is one in Jericho, Ramallah, Nablus, Bethlehem, and all of these cities. We have the same university, but a branch in each city. And this is a good university because you have a good education system and you have time to work or if you are to work and you continue your degree at the same time because you don't have to attend the whole lectures. You can do it from uh, far away from uh, once you have time, you can come. You have just to be on the exam day exactly. And uh, it's cheaper than other private universities. Uh, about the Bedouins, uh, they left to other places like uh, they have not only one place to be in. For example, if they are in this street or in this area, at the same time, they have another place near the mountain or like near other cities. But uh, they came to Jericho because it's the nearest place to them. And they have relatives near the spring of a duke who are there. So it's easy for them to share a piece of land or like this because they don't have much uh, things to put, you know, it's only a tent and a place for the goats. They can share that area and be there. Uh, other people, they, and they did it before. As I told you before, they build a small house in an in area in Jericho or other cities. And they stay in the house in that area and they still have the goats around with them. But they don't move like before. Thank you, Tarek. Tarek, do you have um, anything else that you want to add? Um, I'm going to play a song at the end of this. Um, but also, can you tell people where they can find you if they want to follow you on social media? Um, and if they come to Jericho, <laughs> how to get in touch with you if they want a special tour from uh, Mr. Samarat and how they can help you. They're asking how they can help you. Yeah, so uh, you are always welcome to visit Jericho. You have to make sure that you always have a second home in Jericho in Palestine. And if you visit, your visit will be so easy and smooth because we have friends everywhere. We like to help people and make your visit easy and uh, simple. So uh, if you can, Nancy, to give them my Instagram. Uh, I don't know how to share it somewhere. And uh, um, there is so many people, places to stay in Jericho, like the hostel I'm living in, uh, I'm working in, which is called Obergingas House. You can find it in, uh, I think I'm speechless now. I forgot the name. You can find it anywhere. Uh, about uh, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, which we call eggplant in um <laughs> in the US. Yeah, the house the house, the house of eggplants. Egg <laughs> the house of eggplants, yeah. Uh, you can find it on TripAdvisor for booking. And uh, what was the second question, Nancy? I forgot, sorry. Um, just people asking how they can help you, how they can support you. Now keep sharing the truth, guys. Just keep, if you would like to come to see the reality and what's going on, and you can share around worldwide about what's happening inside. Otherwise, uh, that's it, because we it's sharing. And now the sharing the news became really a huge problem for us because if you try to speak they're gonna make a huge troubles for us they arrest us and stay in jail for six months or a couple of years it depends and uh, they abandon us to cross some specific places because they say okay you're not allowed to come from here or like uh, you kind of did something wrong because of sharing and just keep sharing the truth and free palestine we appreciate you, Habibi. We're going to hopefully at some point be able to do a live virtual tour with you in Jericho once we figure that out. It would be beautiful to have you take us around Jericho live 
um, Bilfada while it's still light. <laughs> um, I'm going to play a video. Stay with us. If there's any final questions, please throw them in the chat. I'm going to play a video. Um, it's a collection of artists from all over the world that did a track for Palestine recently. Some of the graphics are quite um, triggering. Um, they're from Gazi. Uh, at the same time, Maureen will throw in the chat the link to our website where you can find our past events, where you can make donations. You can sign up to make monthly donations to help us. It doesn't matter how much it is, whether it's a dollar, two dollars, ten dollars. Everything helps to keep us bringing you these programs and supporting our people on the ground. Um, we appreciate everybody that's been part of this today. I will wait till the end of the song. And if there's any more um, any more questions, please throw them in the chat. We are going to stop the recording just for the copyrights of the uh, music that we're about to play. <laughs> 